Greetings and welcome back once again. This is Amuna going live. I'm going to read today. So let's go ahead and get ready. Greetings and welcome back once again. This is Amuna and I pray everybody is doing well. The week just start. I'm going to say, why am I for just do a live and read? <laughs> you know, can we have some other things I do? But um, I pray everybody's doing well and welcome to the conversation. Like I have been saying, we are on the latter part of this book series and it has ruffled some feathers it has brought some enlightenment it has lightened some spirits it has helped you know with epiphanies it has helped in the healing process it has helped reignite the love of reading and with all those things my offer give thanks you understand me i say because nothing is just going to be one thing everybody's going to have their reactions or the way in which they feel about the information, right? And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that as we continue on today, as I was preparing this, like I said, the cross-referencing, some appreciate it, some, I'm on a way, keep on a jump. This is topic-oriented. So today's topic is what happened on December the 3rd, 1976. And why this part is specifically important is because this is the plot line or the jump in part of the movie. Remember, much like everybody else, I was here minding my business, occasionally singing, turn your lights down low and war, you know, depending on the day. And then it's like, oh, this movie is coming out. But I just wanted to, for myself, let me get that straight, for myself, I wanted some clarity before I watched the movie. Because sometimes when people do like Ray, um, sometimes when people do different biopics, it's accurate and it's not accurate. You understand what I'm saying? So for my own edification, I began to do the research. And when I found more, I said, oh, this is worth sharing. And that's how I'm here with you. I'm grateful I've met all of you. But that just for some clarity. So the movie, we must go back to the movie now. And I know it's usually early, a little earlier than I usually come on. And for those who have missed it, my apologies, but I had to come on a little early today. So I'm going to jump over to the plot and read the plot as it is written on Wikipedia about the movie. Okay. Let me come and shout out everybody who's here. Blessings. Uh, yeah. I said, let me make it a little earlier today. We got people coming in from the UK. Shout out to everybody who has just joined us. And sometime our UK massive is late at night over there. Right. So I said, let me go ahead and jump on early here. I know we're all in different time zones. So the plot at that can be found on Wikipedia, right? Of the One Love movie. And then I'm going to enjoy everybody. If you have Amazon Prime, go back, go watch the movie because now that we have so much context, some of which many of us didn't have and why the movie was so confusing in the beginning, now we can understand. Even I did a movie review after I first saw the movie. Only after having read um, Rita and, and Sadella's book did I do that review because it gave me some clarity. But the reviews were so mixed and the, the pushback on the movie was so much that I was like, what's going on here? You know what I mean? So let's read the plot. It says, in 1976, okay, amidst armed political conflict that is affecting daily life in Jamaica, Bob Marley announces he will perform at a concert, Smile Jamaica. So this is why you see the Smile Jamaica and you see the Smile Jamaica because he actually made a song for it. And that was, I guess, the label for the song. And I have it a little small up in the top, but that was the actual flyer for the concert. So this is the setting. People's like, why them never start when they're in a nine mile and trench tone? This is the entry point for the movie. And I'm not only going to just read the plot, I'm going to read Don Taylor's account and Rita's account, because this is the entry point for the movie. This is what the movie is centered around. 
Okay. So then we could say, okay, did they keep it true to form or did they change it, right? Promoting peace amongst the warring fractions. While preparing for the concert, Marley, his wife Rita, and several other members of his band are shot by assailants. So this is what we're going to look in today. And, they, and this thing happened on the 3rd of December, right? It says Rita and Marley are hospitalized but survive and recover from their injuries in time for the concert. What am I reading? I'm reading the Wikipedia page for the plot of the One Love movie. After performing, Marley saddened that his own countrymen would try to ant him and his wife shows the, cord, the crowd his bullet wounds before walking off stage. He tells Rita to take their children to Delaware in the United States and stay with his mom as he and the rest of the band venture to London. But we know, according to reports, that first they went to Bahamas before they went to London. But let's continue. After struggling to come up with a new album concept, Marley asks Rita to rejoin him and the band in England and take inspiration from the soundtrack of the film Exodus. And we see that part in the movie. If you saw the movie, they have them like, oh, they're, they're playing the Ten Commandments movie and they're like, oh, what's going on? No, no, he wasn't playing the movie. He was playing the soundtrack. And then one of the band members and then Bob gets inspired, right? So this right here, this point in time is a, a, a transitionary moment for him and his whole story. Because at this point, he goes from this rising star to, to this legend because of escaping his near-death escape, right? And taking inspiration from the soundtrack and the film Exodus and their own situation. And the band began recording what would become the album of the same name, Exodus. OK, the album becomes a hit and helps further popularize reggae music and the Rastafari movement around the world. Remember, if those have just joined us, Amuna, what are you reading? I am reading the plot. Every movie have a plot. Why are we disappointed? Because we appointed something. You can't disappoint if you never appoint. You, know? you, you can't not make an appointment that you didn't schedule. So the appointment was what you thought the buy-up was going to be by epic pick what you imagined it to be the topics we imagined it to cover but this was the plot that's not what they were going for okay it goes on to say marley also aims for stops to africa to inspire the people there this leads to friction with rita as she and marley argue about his responsibilities and both his and rita's infidelities Again, if you didn't know that Rita had infidelities, if you didn't know that this was going on, you wouldn't understand what that conversation was about. Like, I didn't know. I wasn't all in the people business. I didn't know about Stephanie really. I didn't know. I knew Marley was doing some stuff, but I really didn't know the run-ins until I came and read the books. Okay. It says here, in addition to having given up on promoting peace back in Jamaica, Marley also gets into the altercation with manager Don Taylor over a financial dispute. All of this in I platinum, when they propose the movie, when they take up the millions of dollars, how much millions for make it? $70 million budget. For say, what are we shooting? What is this movie? What is the focal point? What is the message? This are, this are the treatment, yes, sir. Or, or the, the synopsis of what the movie is going to be about. Let's continue. After a toenail infection rises, concern from Rita and his recorder, record producer Chris Blackwell, Marley is later diagnosed with rare, a rare skin cancer. This is all the movie. Blackwell confronts Marley about treatment choices, reluctantly dismissed by a firm Marley. We read some of that like two episodes ago when Rita is in Paris, according to this, and the man takes off the toenail. So we read some of that to give us more context, right? It goes on to say, uh, where are we? Faced with his own mortality, Marley reconciles with Rita and Taylor and finally decides to return to Jamaica in 1978, where he is welcomed back by a crowd at the airport. Back home, the gunman who had shot him and others arrives and begs for forgiveness. Now, according to what we're going to read, that, that doesn't happen, but I guess that's artistic license, to which Marley states he keeps no vengeance. After Marley debuts a song to Rita and the children about reconciliation, she finally deems him ready to perform a peace concert. 
The film ends as Marley and his band gear up to perform again for the Jamaican crowd with the song One Love. Okay, great. So that is the plot. I read the entirety of the plot. And now we're going to um, go into the book accounts. And we're going to start with Don because in the book of, um, in the sequential order of the books, Don Taylor book come first, right? Let me come to the comment section real quick and then we're going to continue. Okay, just tripping. Yeah, I came on a little early today. UK Massive is in the building. I know it's nighttime over there. Shout out to everybody who has just joined us. Devin says in the movie, when he shows up in London, there's a caption on the screen that says three months later. We aren't really telling what happened within the three months. Correct. All right. So let's now get started here. Let's get started. Now there's a video uh, and I read the comments, although some of some of the comments, a lot of the comments are positive. A lot, you know, I, if you have any concerns, I, I, I listen and read those as well. But at this time, you know, asking Bob what happened outside of whatever he left on record, we can't do. So we have to go with, you know, trying to pick sense from what is, has been left on record, right? So with that, there is a short video of Bob saying what happened, and then we're going to go to Don Taylor's account, okay? Let's go, let's start there. Doo -doo 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 -doo. All right, this is Bob talking about that day. Was anything, did anything happen to you that caused you to write that? Well, 1976, I'm shoot off from the right. Yes. And I figured that was survival, you know? Yeah. What happened when you were shot? You were in your home. Yeah. Was it in the morning or at night or what happened? Well, it was about, um, well, I said about 9 o'clock in the night. Yeah. What happened is that um, the night before, about three nights before that, I, I was living at a place called Pool B, you know? Mm. And I went to about 3 o'clock in the morning and get, a, and get some sleep. And then I vision I was in a lot of gunshot, you know. That was that was a, a dream. I was in a, a, a barrage, a gunshot, and but when when, when it all over, you know, it's like me never really getting a shot. But me see my mother get shot, you know. The vision show my mother get shot in her head. And what happened is that the vision said, "Don't run," you know. It's like doing you know, all of this gunshot. It's like something that the vision said, "Don't run." Stand up. So when the gunshots started firing on Hope Road, the first thing come back to my mind was the vision. And all I could remember is that the vision said, don't run. And so I have to stand up, you know. And, you know, them fire fire until it was tired of fire and then two is, is, is not really a laughable gun battle. Man start to run and it ease up, you know. And that Where was, were you hit? Eh? Where were you hit? Me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Went right through? What just No, I said lodge inside there. Yeah? Yeah. You never saw the gunman? Well, at that time, no. But you know who did it? Yeah, I know him. Were they caught? No, but I don't caught the police. Mm. It's just, you know, quarantine. All right. So we heard from Tough Gang himself, Nesta, about that day. Okay. He told us it was about nine o'clock at night. His is a living autobiography through his songs, through his interviews, through whatever. You understand? So he did leave a lot on record. Okay. He says it was about nine o'clock at night. They were rehearsing. Um, they were gonna do this concert. That's what they're rehearsing for. Uh, he got a vision before, so he got a premonition because many people say he was spiritual. So then he had a premonition of what was gonna happen. And the dream told him be easy and stand still, as we heard him say. So when it happened, and I wanted to find another video that said, the, the way he turned, but I couldn't find that video in time. So I just put this one up there. Needless to say, um, he got a shot in his elbow. He said he saw his mother, but we know 
the mother was actually Rita, who he possibly saw, because Rita and his mother had a strong resemblance. And um, yeah, and then he asked him, did you, did you know who did it? Right. And the way he kind of sidestepped that, the way he kind of evaded the question, if you listen intently when you read Don Taylor's book, I could kind of see why he did it that way. But nonetheless, we're just dealing with December the 3rd. So now we're going to start. And somebody said something rightfully. They said, Amuna, when you start reading, sometimes you don't give the page number and the chapter. So my apologies for that. I'm going to give you the page number and the chapter. Chapter is chapter 10, the free consent and the assassination attempt. And the page number is 135. So this is Don Taylor's account, right? This is Don Taylor's account. And I'm going to jump down because Don Taylor is already, Don Taylor is already, um, he's already having this conversation about where he was and what he was doing and the fact that he was gambling and he had to go to Miami. I'm just fast forwarding here. You could definitely read it. He had to go to Miami to pick up a $143,000 check for Bob that had came in. And so he was in the middle of a gambling spree in Kingston when he decided that he needed to leave, right? And then he went to Miami and picked up the money and now he's back. He picked up the money and now he's back. So he says, on my way, on my return the following day, I collected the car and headed to Kingston. And, and Don Taylor's return from Miami, right? I went straight for the airport to the club to see how Dynamite was doing. This is the person who he put in charge of his gambling situation. He was in fact even, which was considerably better than the $60,000 I was losing when I left. I then went over to the house of Chen on Nutsford Boulevard, a stone's throw from the Sheraton. While waiting, I ate my fill of curry goat. And then I left the club and drove to the Sheraton where I was to pick up Chris, meaning Chris Blackwell, right? But Chris was not there. I returned to the car and proceeded to 56 Hope Road. I still had in the car a couple of cases of whiskey that I had bought earlier and a briefcase that I brought back from Miami for a friend who worked at Le Salis. I also had in my possession the royalty check for 143000 that I had brought back for Bob. This is, the, this is him leading up to that day. He says, I returned, I turned into Hope Road and parked the car as usual under the driving alone and entered the house from the front, which led from the veranda into the hall. And if you watch the movie, they're giving you like the layout of everything, right? As I entered, I could hear the rehearsal going on. So I looked in the room located downstairs next to the kitchen. The full band was at work, but I did not see Bob. This is according to, this is according to Don Taylor now. So he says he proceeded to the kitchen and saw Bob standing in the corner cutting a grapefruit. And you will see this depicted in the movie. That means they had to be reading this book. Either you were reading this book because if the band was in the kitchen, I mean, the band was uh, doing uh, rehearsal and Rita was in her car. Who saw the grapefruit situation? Where did you get that information from, right? Somebody had to be researching. They had to get it from somewhere. So according to Don Taylor, he was in the kitchen and Bob was cutting a grapefruit. I told him I wanted to speak with him and that I would also eat a piece of the grapefruit. A long time in eating a grapefruit, you know, because... I can't seem for some find to see them. Sorry, side note. I like grapefruit, but let's continue. He beckoned me to come for it. And as I reached out for the grapefruit, I heard a sound like a firecracker. So I can to Dan Taylor, him come right in at the time where the thing I pop off. I that him I say. Okay? Him never dare the whole time. I know him I come. Okay. He beckoned me to come for it. And I reached out for the grapefruit. I heard a sound like a firecracker. As it was Christmas, I paid little attention and Bob asked me, who would be see a bus firecracker in my yard? Now, if you watch the movie, it's making sense that you are going to see that firecrackers are going off and it's kind of at night and because they're setting the whole scene, okay? This is also in the movie. Again, like I just read the plot for those who have just joined us, this is where the movie is 
enter into the conversation. Devon says Don Kingsley was also in the kitchen with Bob. So we have three people said to be in the kitchen, right? We have one person who wrote it down and we are hearing that another person was in the kitchen. Okay. It goes on to say, so Bob says, who the BC a bus firecracker in a yard? But before he could allegedly, okay, that's what he said. And but, but before he could finish the sentence, we both clearly heard the repetitious rat -tat 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 sound. So before they got to them, Rita, remember, she's outside in the car. We're going to read her account as well. She's outside in the... <laughs> I'm just reading the book out here, y'all. I'm just reading the books out here. I'm just reading the books. That is public consumption for nothing more than edification of the public who was given this movie, okay? It goes on to say, but before he could finish the sentence, they heard the ratata, and suddenly they felt a... No, not they. Don is saying suddenly he felt a burning sensation that he had never felt before, but he didn't realize that he was shot. Okay. This is Don's account. We just heard Bob's account because sometimes people's like, oh, Bob not there for speak. Bob already told us what happened, right? From his perspective. Now Don, who was also there, is telling us from his perspective. He says what, I, what he did feel was his body going limp. And he fell forward on to Bob. This Adana says so, you know. So him feel a burning sensation, him feel him body go limp, and him fall forward on to Bob, he says. He says, um, where am they? He says, whose only exclamation was Selassie Jarastafari. No, you're, you're early, Stephanie. Welcome to the conversation for those who just um, joined us. So Don is saying that he remembers Bob saying, Slassie, I, Jarasta, fire, I, when the shots started to fire in the kitchen, unfortunately. He says he recalls Bob holding him up in front of him while they kept shooting. As soon as the shooting stopped, Bob let go of him and he sank into unconsciousness. So somebody will say, how did, um, how did Don Taylor end up with five shots? According to Don Taylor, he fell onto Bob and Bob was holding him. And that's how he picked up those. Okay. It goes on to say, I am just reading what he wrote on page 135. It says it all happened so fast. It seemed unreal. When he regained consciousness, he was still laying in the kitchen. There was dead silence. He says, then gradually he can hear voices and he heard Bob say, them shoot up Dan Taylor, Dan Taylor dead or something. Okay, so Dan Taylor, because of the injury, right? First he's saying he didn't hear anything and then he began to hear conversations happening. And he's saying that this is what he said, heard Bob say. Amidst, so basically he heard Bob say they shot up Don Taylor, Don Taylor dead or something. Amidst the crosstalk between them, he picked up the refusal of the Rastafarians to lift him up as they objected to picking up deadas. I found this part curious. So now he's on the floor, but because he's bleeding and they're unsure of his condition, and if you on a Nazarite vow and you touch a dead body, you got to trim your locks and be unclean for a certain point period of time, according to the biblical text. Now they're having this back and forth, according to Don Taylor, that they don't want to, quote, pick up dead ass. He says he tried to say something, but no words came out. And although he can hear everything, they, he was unable to speak. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Wentworth Johnson. Let's get the likes up. Let's get the likes up. We're trying to we're trying to establish um, a space for for conversation, for discussion based on you know not just a conjecture. You understand? Not just hearsay, but the people's accounts, right? So yeah, it may seem a little bit different than if I was a gossip channel. Is enough gossip channel out here? Allow me one second. That people are not having no questions about. 
they in the 200, 300,000, 400,000, half a million people every day you drop a video with no substantiated evidence except for a like on a post, right? And people eat it up. Now we over here having conversations that's built on what was left on record. And, and you know what I mean? I don't get it. I don't get it. Well, I'll continue. Anywho, Don Taylor goes on to say, he tried to say something, but no words came out. And although he could hear everything, he was unable to speak. A great sense of shock, but also amusing really hit him. So what could, at this point, this is me thinking, if he's unable to speak or he's, his body's in shock, there's, his body, his soul could have possibly momentarily separated. And a lot of people say like when they go under anesthesia or um, they can hear everything that's going on, but they can't, the people can't hear them, right? So there are many cases, even medical cases that people report that something like this has happened, right? So he's hearing it, but they, he's not able to communicate to them. I did not know at the time that his main artery was broken and he was losing a great deal of blood, he says. He was hearing everything clearly at the time. In fact, it was almost as if he was two people. That's why I'm saying his soul and his body. Possibly they didn't totally separate, but because of the trauma, that's another subject for another day, but it can, it can momentarily separate. So he's saying, he's describing it as feeling as though he was two people. Outside of his body, hearing everything and detached from the pain and suffering of the body lying inert in the kitchen floor. Okay. It goes on to say, meanwhile, the body lying on the kitchen floor was a, was feeling a great weight of blood running down its thigh and was struggling through the midst of consciousness to find out how badly it was hurt. And the voice on the outside was actually telling it that maybe they had shot off his joint in tool. Seriously, Don, is that what you were thinking about, Don? Like, oh, backside, <laughs> you know, if them sh shut off him things. Seriously? So the body on the floor slowly pushed its hand into the waist of the pants. And, what, and once the message was clear that his joint was intact, the inert body relaxed again into unconsciousness. So you, I'm not even going to, I'm going to keep it. This is a serious matter. So I'm, and sometimes I don't even be trying to be funny. So I'm going to just keep it as serious as I can in this matter, even though he wrote that in there, even though he wrote that in there, I'm just going to, I'm just keep going down. Cause you're trying to get me off topic right now. The police and Bob lifted me up from the floor. So I guess Bob finally decided or, or, or amongst them, he decided that he was going to um, help because according to Don Taylor earlier, they weren't sure who was going to help the police and the body lift. No, sorry. The police and Bob lifted him up from the floor and placed him in the police car. And as they rested him on the back seat of the car, he could hear the police saying, set him siren no work. So the police who picked them up said, boy, and the emergency, but him siren don't work. Somehow he found this quite amusing. He says that he also heard the policeman say that he had been shot in the abdomen and that he needed to move quickly, almost immediately. Then another police vehicle with a siren arrived and escorted them to the hospital. Okay, so they got the siren, the escort. It goes on to say, yeah, Don was over there worrying what happened to his buddy. Exactly, Don. Let's, let's focus on the situation at hand, bro. It goes on to say, he was taken to the university hospital, which was not far from 56 Hope Road. He still wasn't able to see or speak, but could hear. And that he heard the nurses asking for two stretchers as there was one dead person. Yes, this is very horrific. And again, he's witnessing it because his soul is out of his body, but also traveling along the body because the body is losing so much, right? It says that the, the nurse asked for two stretchers. Yes, exactly. They lucky they were in such close proximity to the hospital. So he was, she was like, because one person, it, it didn't make it. He says he did not realize this in any way to himself as his mind was functioning quite clearly. Now we could get into the whole thing of the soul and the mind and the body because he's recounting this very vividly for someone who 
was in was I, I was unconscious. Like I personally know somebody who had the, a similar near death experience, and they were able to recount everybody who was talking, whoever was in the room, what they were saying. Like I'm not talking about I'm I'm reading a book. I'm talking about I know somebody who 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 had this a similar experience, not from an accident, not from this thing, but something tra tragic, right? So it does happen. It says here. When the stretchers arrived, however, he remembers the nurse checking him and saying that this one is dead. Put him in the metal stretcher and take that one over there. She was referring to Bob. So they didn't know how everybody, how bad everybody was hit, but they were already declaring that, that Don was a goner. And he's hearing all of this. He says, I was still hearing all of this and that his body, his outside body and the, the inert one both wanted to scream. No, he says, he's alive. But try as he might, the body lying on the stretcher could not respond. Okay. He goes on to say that the body on the inside was talking to the one on the outside. Recounting how he had heard of the people being buried alive and how real it was going to be for him. All right. He heard the nurse tell the older, the orderly to take him to the morgue and leave him by the door. Like, did she check all the vitals, bro? That nurse, what, she was ready to go home? Like, she, did you check him? How did you know? Anyway, it says here, um, maybe so that the doctor could pronounce him deceased before they tagged him. They began to push him down the corridor to the morgue when he heard a voice in the distance asking who and what this was. It turned out to be a doctor and the voice outside of him pleaded for him to take a look and wished to cry out, but couldn't. The orderly told him he would leave him by the door for him to check. To his relief or to Don's relief, the doctor said, let me check him first before you take him to the morgue. He says, I recognize the Bahamian lint in the voice, which I later learned belong to an inner doctor, sorry, an intern, Dr. Philip Thompson. Because uh, if you read Don's story at one time, he goes to, um, when he leaves Jamaica, he goes to Bahamas. And you know, Baham Bahamians have a distinct accent as well. So he's like, he, he recognizes his accent, right? So the intern was like, um, my outside voice reacted with an urgent application while the inside voice urged the doctor to go on. He heard the doctor approach the stretcher and began to check him. And to his relief, suddenly says, this man is not dead. He is alive. The excitement was like an electronic, electric charge to the ear. He sent Don back to the emergency room immediately and ordered blood to stabilize him as he had lost much. As was becoming typical of Jamaica in the 70s, however, and also because it was Christmas, the lady with the key to the blood bank was at a party. Wow. She turned out to be Miss Trot, uh, the wife of Deputy Commissioner the, of Police, Larry Trot, who had himself played an important part in the state of emergency and was the prime minister's chief man. He was also someone that he knew from youth and whom he called Godfather a name used to, in Jamaica to refer to an older person who you respected, who may have assisted you in your youth. He goes on to say the mind of the body in the stretcher smiled at the unfolding scenario for he had heard tales of this kind about the university hospital and indeed all Jamaican hospitals. Let me see here. Hold on there. Hold on there. He goes off to talking about the hospitals, but hold on. Finally, the doctor was, I'm jumping down, was able to get him stabilized and he regained consciousness to the point where he could open his eyes. As soon as the open with both, sorry, as soon as I opened them, he says, with bo both body and mind connected, he could feel the constant burning almost as if someone had opened him up and placed pepper in his wounds. He looked up and saw standing over him Prime Minister Michael Manley and his wife Beverly, who he, who he could see was crying. He does not recall what they might have said, but he could see the concerns on their faces. 
okay? It was only then that he was able to inquire after Bob. He was told that he had been shot through his arm and a bullet had grazed his chest. He then discovered that Rita had been shot in the front yard in her head between scalp and skull. So for those who had saw that conversation um, and seen it part in the movie, for those who have just joined us, I read the plot of the movie. I played Bob Marley's account of what happened. Now we're reading Don Taylor's because the plot of the movie centers around this moment that pushes them out of the country into self-imposed exile into England, right? So this part is very important as it relates to why I even started reading all these books in the first place, right? The movie, where am I? So he's saying Michael Manley and Beverly Kane. It goes on to say, Rita went, underwent surgery for the removal of the bullet and was retreated and released. He was actually the most seriously hurt and needed an immediate operation so as to assess the extent of damage and determine what needed to be done internally. All right. Welcome to those who just joined us. Right now we are on page 138 of Don Taylor's account of what happened on December the 3rd, 1970. Six. It goes on to say, when it was time to operate on him, he was still so excited at being pronounced alive that he forgot to tell the doctors or the nurses, nor did they remember to ask that earlier. Remember, what did he eat earlier? He told us what he ate earlier. What did he eat? Curry goat. So his belly is full, which is problematic because in Yam the curry goat, go a hope road, the thing happened, no him in a problems, and curry goat. Probably on white rice, because who do you usually eat curry goat on white rice? I don't know white rice, but he definitely had the curry goat dinner. Okay. He says here um, that he had eaten earlier at the house of Chen before he had gotten shot. He says that blissfully unaware, the doctors opened him up and proceeded to operate. The operation was successful as it could have been, and he was left on the recovery table but then started to suffocate from all the food that he had eaten. Now coming up as a result of the anesthesia and the fact that his stomach had not been pumped. But once again, fate played its hand as the doctor had forgotten his bag in the recovery room and his return to the room discovered his state and took the proper corrective action. The next morning he woke up to find himself in the recovery room of the university hospital. He had an emergency operation on his leg, but a bullet was still lodged in his spine and his left and right sides were both paralyzed. He could not move. It says, he asked Dr. Thompson why they did not operate and he said it was a miracle that he was still alive. And if only, immediate, if only his immediate problem was the loss of feeling in both sides, then he should consider himself lucky and not be impatient. To him, it sounded more like an excuse for a hospital, which apparently was not equipped to treat his type of gunshot wound. He saved his life, right? But because of the five shots that he got and the, 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 the limited capabilities, he was temporarily paralyzed, Okay. It says he pumped him for information and was finally told that he could do what he could do. But he got the distinct feeling that the doctor seemed to feel that he should be grateful that they saved his life and that he should expect nothing more. By this time, his friends had gotten in touch with his second wife, who was named April Beckford Taylor and who was nine months pregnant with his son, Christopher. So, from what we see here, Don Taylor had a son named Christopher with his second wife, April. She flew down from Miami as soon as she was told of the incident. He goes on to say, he asked if her to get in touch with the U.S. Veterans Administration. And if you're not aware, according to the book, what happened is Don Taylor leaves Jamaica. He goes to Bahamas. Then he comes to America and then he enlists in the army. And because he enlisted in the army, he's counted a veteran. This is why he is, he did, I forgot how many years he did, but he's counted as a veteran. And this is why he's asking her to get in touch with the VA. 
I asked her to get in touch with the US VA and inform them of my service in the military and to get from them the names of doctors who are accustomed to working with bullets and bullet wounds. And so it was that they got in touch with Dr. William Bacon. That name is familiar. And the reason why that name later becomes familiar because when the situation arises with Bob Marley's toe, Don Taylor refers him to William Bacon. Remember, we read that like two episodes ago, and then they were like, oh, name like Bacon and that kind of something there, right? So let's continue. It says here, and so it was that we got in touch with Dr. William Bacon to the Veterans Administration in Miami. We're still on the aftermath of, of what happened at the night, and then we're going to go to Rita's account, okay? Because sometimes people say, oh, Dana, tell the truth. Ray and Tay and Tay. So I'm doing a little cross-referencing. We heard Bob. And for those who just came in, what I'm going to do is, in light of we just heard from um, Don Taylor, we're going to hear Bob again, and then we're going to go on to read it. It says here, where are we? Arrangements were then made for me to be transferred to Miami. He says, a private chartered medical plane. Chris Blackwell arranged and paid for it. Remember, Chris Blackwell was in town. Everybody is ready. The event is happening on Sunday, if I'm mistaken. Um, the fifth, this is the third. Everybody's in town. It's going to be huge. And this happens. So Chris Blackwell is in town. So he says Chris Blackwell paid for the chartered plane. And so he went to Miami where they performed a two-hour operation on his spine at the Cedars of Lebanon Hospital. And by the next morning, he was able to walk around. Well, thank goodness for the treatment that he was able to get at the hospital to be able to regain his ability to walk. It says, he remained in Miami at his house because he lived there, right? Located in Southwest area, a far cry from Overtown where he had lived when he first arrived from Jamaica. But the show had to go on and many persons, including the prime minister, urged Bob to perform. The concert would now feature Third World, and I later learned that a constant report by two-way radio was relayed to Bob, who listened to the tributes while he still wavered about whether or not to attend. And there's an article that goes into that, that speaks about, and I think if I'm not mistaken, um, it's depicted in the movie because right now we're talking about the plot of the movie. All of a lot of what we are uh, reading about now is again, like I said, it's depicted in this one love movie. A lot of which people are like, oh, they should have went into this. They should have went into this. This was their focal point. Okay. And what happens afterwards. So it goes on to say the word that Bob was going to perform spread like wildfire. They said he was like two, two, two hours late or something like that. The band members Kinsey, Downey, Carly were located and Cat Core fin filled in for family man who could not be found. Bob bounced onto the stage and by all reports gave a performance of une unequaled excellence. He spoke to the crowd in his usual way saying, when Miss decided to do this your concert two and a half months ago, me was told there was no politics. I just wanted to play for the love of the people. And it was a free concert. And then he broke out into war. So um, it was a free concert, right? So he wanted to play for the people and they, it, it got usurped. And this was the result, right? It says, after the concert, Bob went to his house in Nassau to rest. Well, they said they went. he went to Chris Blackwell's house, but okay. And took Rita and the kids, both his and hers. Why Don had to sit in the middle of all this, both his and hers? For them, for them. He constantly kept in touch by phone, using this means to discuss business and inquire after each other's health. So I'll leave it right there, finishing on page 140, about Don Taylor's very interesting, very detailed account. How in the world did he know that stuff when he was unconscious about what happened prior to the shooting, what happened during the shooting, what happened after it? Now, I'm going to... Go ahead and play Bob's account one more time, and then we're going to go into Rita. Greetings and welcome to those who have just joined us. So let me go ahead now and play this again for those who missed it in the beginning, and then we're going to continue. Was anything, did anything happen to you that caused you to write that? Well, 1976, I'm shoot off from the right. 
Yes. And I figured that was survival, you know. Yeah. What happened when you were shot? You were in your home. Yeah. Was it in the morning or at night or what happened? Well, it was about, um, well, I said about 9 o'clock in the night. Yeah. What happened is that um, the night before, about three nights before that, I, I was living at a place called Pool B, you know? Mm. And I went to about 3 o'clock in the morning and get, a, and get some sleep. And then I vision I was in a lot of gunshot, you know? That was, that was a, a dream. I was in a, a, a barrage, a gunshot, and but when when, when it all over, you know, it's like me never really get no shot, but me see my mother get shot. You know, the vision show my mother get shot in her head. And what happened is that the vision said, "Don't run." You know, it's like do you know that this gunshot is like something that the vision said, "Don't run, stand up." So when the gunshot start firing a whole road, the first thing come back to my mind was the vision. And all I could remember is that the vision said, don't run. And somebody have to stand up, you know. And, you know, them fire fire until it was tired of fire and then she is, is, is not really a laughable gun battle. Man start to run and it ease up, you know. And that Where was, were you hit? Eh? Where were you hit? Me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Went right through? Or just skin No, I'm said large inside there. Yeah? Yeah. You never saw the gunman? Well, at that time, no. But you know who did it? Yeah, I never knew that. Were they caught? No, but I don't caught the police. Mm. It's just, you know, when I'm thinking. All right, so we heard Bob's account. We heard Don Taylor's account of what happened. Don Taylor was a more, a little more descriptive of the situation. Now we're gonna hear Rita because she had a different vantage point, right? She had a different vantage point because she was she had already gone outside. It says in the fall of nine, sorry, chapter eleven, <laughs> page one hundred and forty-five. Shout out to the person like, Amuna, sometimes you don't know where I read from. I feel you, I feel you. Chapter 11, page 145. In the fall of 1976, when an election scheduled, the crime rate in Jamaica was high. Tensions was running, were running high, and the government had been unable to bring any stability to certain areas in Kingston. She said that we had been independent since 1962 and black people finally had the right to vote. But many of Jamaica's poor were still suffering, not only in the city ghettos like Trenchtown, but in rural areas like St. Anne. And this is why I say reading, um, reading Beverly uh, Manley's book is important because Beverly Manley is the backdrop. Michael Manley era is the backdrop for what happened in this conversation. What Rita is working up to is the backdrop, right? But let's continue anyway. It says both political parties, the Jamaica Labor Party and the People's National Party continue to make promises they could not keep and continue to use the rude boys for their own purposes. When it was time for politics, the party bosses would hand out guns and say, go mm, the opposition. After elections, they'll be able to take these guns back because the boys were now gun crazy. She says they weren't, sorry. No, it says they were. So you'd find these, oh, unable, sorry. So you'd find these street th thugs or whatever name you want to call them with guns in their hands and the war continued. By this time, she says they had been touring long enough to be known all over the world, which only added to Bob's already existing reputation in Jamaica. At home, he was seen as the, quote, voice of the people, end quote. And the ghetto youth were very aware of this. Despite his move uptown, they still regarded him very highly. The biggest murder, the biggest gunman would come to him for help. Hope Road became a welfare center. There was no right, there was no night there. 24 hours a day they arrived demanding to see him. 
You see, you heard he just said that he went home to Bull Bay. We're just telling you the condition of Hope Road, why he wouldn't be able to get. So that's why he said it was three o'clock in the morning and he went home to get some sleep. He wouldn't have been able to get sleep there. Right. It says here. Um, he he'd become more important than the prime minister. It began to seem as if he had to live for them. Adding to this, he was subjected to certain pressures from one party or the other, and it was risky to be in the middle. He was living a very dangerous life simply because he had brought all this attention to the island of Jamaica through music. So he started off with the music and the music becomes political. Don, Don, he kind of goes into that a little more, but you can read that at your own discretion. It can be nice to be on top, but not when some heavy burdens settle on your shoulders. You may be up there, but you're also out there. Bob had no time for himself and no privacy. Right? It reached the point where people preyed on him, people who felt that he had to have them around for quote unquote protection. For one thing, because quote, somebody might try to hurt him, right? This is YouTube, so. And for another thing, you might be able to help them financially, which he always did. You know, I just want to stop here for a second. There's a um, there is a uh, uh, Marlene. What's her name? Marlene. What was the name of Peter Tosh's? Um, she gave an interview with Muta Baruka, and they were it was it Muta Baruka, and they were asking about what happened, what she thinks happened. And then she addressed a rumor saying um, that that Peter Tosh mind bad man, she says in her words. And, and then she goes on to say, everybody knows that Peter didn't do those things and that actually Bob did those things, right? But here is Rita saying, that's what Bob was doing. So I just wanted to put, if I find back that one, please, sometimes people ask me about Peter Tosh as I learn, you know, you saw that, right? And she says, everybody knows that Peter didn't do those things, but here is Rita saying that Bob did do those things in an effort to try to keep Marlene Brown. Yes. In an effort to try to keep everything, what he thought he was keeping everything on the up and up. She's saying that he did those things. So Marlene said it and here is Rita saying it too. Where am I? Uh, it says here. Um, so they had reasons to hang around, to have their prey in view. In one of Bob's songs, he sings, too much mix up, gotta clear my wheels once and for all, gotta clear the wheels. I don't care who falls because it's too much mix up. So now he's on this pressure pot, right? On all sides. He became paranoid and found himself waking up early in the morning, just waiting for the people to come and get him. That is sad. I mean, how many people knew that? that that's a piece of information. A lot of people say, well, he did this and he did that. Imagine the internal pressure that he was under. And we don't have to imagine too much because Rita is now telling us that even before this December situation happened, he is under great pressure because of the political, the greater issue that is going on in the community and the country at large. Um, so he's becoming paranoid and faced with the sort of thing I'm saying, she says, keep it out of the family away from the children. There were times when that they slept on the floor because they had to give up their beds to people who needed to hide out from the other opposing gangs. This is what Rita is saying. Eventually, inevitably, he was targeted to help bring stabilization to the country, to appease the ghetto youth. The government said, Bob, and this is okay when the opening movie, because again, I'm I'm exploring the plot of the movie. Right? I'm exploring the plot of the movie. The plot of the movie is about this time period. So when the when the shot opens up, it's him talking to the press. And you have Rita in the corner looking concerned, right? All of this is is why I think I guess you know we are confused at why they started at this point, but this is the end point. So th this is where you know this is where it is. It says here, Bob, it's only you who can say it through your music. They said, let them, let us have a concert. It was a peace concert they wanted to be called Smile Jamaica in order to calm everyone down before the elections that were to be held in December. Bob invited Peter and Bonnie as the original whalers to perform, but they refused. 
Now, some people is confused because they're like, it, it, they're two different concerts. They're, I think one of the persons who was, um, uh, one of the persons who, um, sorry, one of the persons who was, uh, I was reading the comment from Alexa saying they got the information from Never Garrett. She believes. Uh, sorry about that. It will come back. It, the women that go said just Bob invited Peter and Bunny as the original whalers to perform, but they refused. Peter said he wanted no peace. He wanted equal rights and justice. Equal rights and justice. He wanted equal rights and justice. Bunny said no because the event was political and he wouldn't participate. The concert sponsored by Jamaica Ministry of Culture would be free. At first, it had been planned for Jamaica House, but I, she says she had a dream that they should change the venue, and she told Bob, and he arranged for it to be held at the National Heroes Circle in Kingston. Welcome to those who have just joined us. Let me let me put up a, a picture of the bigger flyer so we can look at what she is saying. Hold on there one second. Where's flyer gone? Take a drink, take a sip, take a sip. Let me see what I'm going here, sir. Woo, equal rights. So this is what the flyer became here. Let me take a little sip of my lemon water, people. All right. So this is what the flyer became. And we see, we see, Mar Bob Marley in a social way, it will hit me situation. <laughs> Something over this thing with cultural section of prime minister office presents. So this is what Rita is telling us. So once again, we're cross-referencing with a flyer, Smile Jamaica, a public concert featuring Bob Marley and the Whalers, Third World, Light of Samba, Richard Ace, St. Anne's, I can't say the next part, that's all, Winston Williams, St. Anne's Dancer, Sunday, December 5th at 5 p.m., National Heroes Park, Kingston Race Course. And attendance is free with three exclamation points. So to all of what they were saying, to all of what they were trying to achieve, there it is. They wanted to do a free concert to get the people to come together. I think actually when they were planning this concert, I don't think I read that part, but Don Taylor at first, when they were planning the concert, didn't think that it was going to be free. And then Bob Marley insisted that it should be free, right? I don't think, if I have an opportunity, maybe we'll find a part there. When they were planning the concert and the time it took before that point. But for the sake of continuity, I'm going to continue, all right? So let me put back on the thing and make it continue. Do, do, do. Which part me did they know? Mm. All right, boom. So it is, um, we're on page 147. She says, we were still so young. Bob was 31 and I was 30. They were very young, very young. A lot of stuff happened in a, in a short period of time, man. It says here, at that age, in such a high profile position in a business full of producers and managers and handlers and what have you, you were not always able to say, well, no, no, thank you on your own. Because why? You're beholden to the record company. You're beholden to whoever's ideas, it, whoever already gave you advances and forwards and money and tie up and dealings. So it feel like you're compelled now to comply. So this is what Rita's saying from her stance. Even if they're like, yo, I don't think it's a good idea. They feel compelled to comply, right? She says, you were always being advised and other people's decisions were so often considered to be, quote, what is right for you, end quote. And even with a room full of advisors, Bob was still caught up in a certain situations that had less to do with his career than his social and political position. Okay. Let me see what's going on here. Let's continue. I want to go on here, sir. It says here, and so he decided to do the concert, even though he realized how dangerous it had become. It was scheduled for Sunday, December the 5th, 1976. Again, this is illustrated in the movie, 
So all we're reading about right now is the movie plot and what we experience with people. Me like the movie, me don't like the movie, them should have done this, them should have done that. It's a, but instead of something for the people, it became something for the politicians. And Bob was being used. Rumor had it that he was doing this for the party in power, the PNP, when that was not so. So the part in the movie where he's driving, I think Ziggy and Steven in the car when he picked them up and he's looking out the window and he's seeing um, spray paint on the wall. If you look at the little nuances, the little details that they put in the movie, you will see this, this sentiment that it went from him doing the uh, concert to him doing the concert backing a certain political party, which because he was trying to toe the line, it kind of backfired, right? Because he was he had people on both sides. He was trying to toe the line and create this peaceful environment. It says here, then this drew some action from the opposition and he was warned not to do the concert because they were going to hem him. Okay. The whole week before, regulars at Hope Road noticed strangers on the premises from time to time. Bob got caught up in this and it was terrible. The divisions and the contradictions, but he was determined to do the show for the people who suffered the most. And like I said, this is what's taking him from the man to the myth, from the man to the legend, because in spite of his own in danger, he's still pushing through to say he's going to do the concert, right? The Friday afternoon before the concert, which would be what we're talking about, December the 3rd, while they were rehearsing, they heard what sounded like firecrackers. And that's what Don Taylor says. So we can give him a point for the firecracker situation. He said firecracker, she said firecracker. It's not Christmas, though sometimes they do have Chinese New Year, so it might be. Later toward evening, she had just said goodbye to Bob because she had to go to another rehearsal that night with the drama group. And the movie, them use this book as a reference because them say, you need me for anything else? And him say, him say something and then she go. She go outside, right? She says, which I kept up with when we, were, we weren't touring and was scheduled to present a musical called Brashana. Oh, I said to him, see you later. And he said, okay, take care. Santi and Senior, two young men from the neighborhood had come to town with me from Bull Bay and they were waiting in the car to go home. As she got in the front seat and turned around to greet them, she saw some guy she didn't recognize on the steps of the second floor she just left. They had their weapons in their hands and she thought, oh no, and quickly started the car. A nice, loud, she's being facetious, Volkswagen, wop, 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 just as they began firing wildly. The sound of the motor distracted one guy who half turned around as he got off a shot towards where she knew Bob was speaking with Don Taylor, his manager. Remember, Bob, Don Taylor said he just came back from Miami. He just brought a check. They're getting ready for the concert. He's wanted to talk to Bob. Bob's in the kitchen eating this grapefruit. So she literally just left them there. She goes on to say, the, then the gunman turned back towards her, stepped, she stepped hard on the gas pedal, vroom, but he and some others came after the car as it began moving. No, I did, I did see Rita's name in the credit. So I think she got credit for it because I saw it in the executive producer credits. So, you know, they, they refer to her in the credits. Let me see what shot me there now. So then, no, she said, trying to get away, she put the pedal to the floor, but then bullets started flying through the car from the rear like crazy. The youths in the back fell to the floor yelling, duck, mommy, duck, duck. She bent as low as she dared over the steering wheel and kept driving until she felt a warm thing coming down her neck and thought, backside, she not say backside, she did. So she thinks, say, she did. Because the bullet hit her head. 
So she stopped a little way from the gate and pulled up the emergency and rested her head on the steering wheel and said to herself that she was dead. And this is how it feels. She thought of auntie, the children, wondering if they really did it, if they took out Bob too, right? One of the gunmen came to the car window and looked in and put his gun at her head. But then he said, everybody dead, everybody dead, and didn't fire again. Come on, so I was with them that day. <laughs> For real. And the people next door started to turn on their lights and heard windows opening. The guy stood there a little longer. She guessed that he was going to make sure that she was finished. But someone must have called the police because she heard a siren. Then with all the noise, he and the other six later learned, obviously realized they had to get out of there and they kept pretending to be dead, trying not to breathe until they heard the footsteps running. So then when she heard the footsteps running, she lifted her head a little to see that the men with the guns were running past the open gate to their car, which was parked across the entrance, blocking the gate. So they couldn't have been able to drive out in any case. Because as they're saying, and everybody's saying, the atmosphere there was, he was open. People could come in. People could come and go. So when the people are coming and going, they're noticing that all of these strange people are kind of like casing the joint. You know? But nonetheless, this is this what became the result. She says the blood was coming through her locks and running down her face. And in the middle of telling herself that she had died, all of a sudden she realized she was still alive and thought, oh, my G.O.D., where is Bob? So after she realized that she's still alive, the next thing she's like, where is Bob? She got out of the car and looked in the back for her two passengers. They were well under the seat. They'd gone. Come. They're, she says they're gone. Come. You can get up. But the poor guys were frozen. The whole back window of the car was shattered. Nobody sitting upright could have come out of there alive. That those young men had survived was a miracle. This whole thing was a miracle. This whole situation was a miracle. Okay. It says Bob could easily have been taken out that night. Too easily. He had gone to the kitchen after she left and had been standing there peeling a grapefruit. So she also says the same thing that Don said. The, she says the, the man them who got him was aiming for the heart, but the bullet just cre creased his chest and hit his elbow and stayed there for the rest of his life and went to his resting place with it. I don't know why I read somewhere or saw somewhere or heard somewhere that he that it was said that he turned sideways. Maybe I, I'll look for that somewhere else and post it on the community board. But according to Don, Don fell over on him. It says, Auntie was at the house in Bull Bay with the kids. And when they heard of the on the radio that Bob Rodney and Rita Marley had been shot, you know they went crazy. Poor Auntie just here out there with the kids. The police went there immediately to get them as they didn't know what to expect next. And if I'm not mistaken, Ziggy tells that story of them coming and just taking them away and them not really knowing what happened. She goes on to say that was close, a close call. And Ja was so good that nobody died that night. Though Don Taylor was stuck by five bullets and eventually airlifted to Miami, one lodged near his spine. Right? So Don just told us that whole story about how he went, what happened, and why he eventually was taken to Miami. So Rita echoes that as well. Where are we? Everyone thought that he was dead. Here, Don said the same thing and wouldn't touch him. Remember, Don said they were all standing around talking about he was dead as this, that, and the third. He says, but Bob lifted him up and put him in a car along with me and Diane Jobson drove us quickly to the hospital. That's what also was said. When they got there, the doctor didn't operate on her right away because they said they couldn't touch the bullet immediately that it was too near the brain. So they allowed it to settle and wait for the swelling to go down. And since this would take a few days, she was admitted to the hospital under police guard. When auntie and the kids came to her, everyone was crying. In the movie, they don't have auntie and the kids coming. They have Bob coming 
and sitting there and looking at her because this is, you know, I'm, we don't know if he did. We know they looked at him as well. But in the movie, they didn't put Auntie and the children. In the movie, they put Bob in that position. And then one of the people saying, oh, come on, Bob, we got to go. We got to go. Um, on Sunday, though I was on stage singing because Bob decided to go ahead and do the concert. And they showed that as well. Come what may, he said that they could they could take him out now, but he was going to do it for the people. So members of the band, some refused to play, so other musicians came together. Judy was also there with her to do background, but Marcia had gone to New York. She had been warned not to perform from early on. She said so she had flown out. Bob stood there, out in the open, exposed to whatever might happen. His arm in a sling, unable to play guitar. It was still in his jacket, hospital jacket. Her head was all bandaged up and everything, but they sang. And again, if you saw the movie, you saw it depicted. Hold on there. Let me drink a little lot water, people. Mm -hmm. This was a lot of reading today. <clears throat> she goes on to say, lastly, she know those shots changed her. And they changed Bob too. That I said, they changed the trajectory of this whole conversation. After that, he was frightened. Though at the concert, he bravely rolled up his sleeve to show his wounds to the crowd and reenacted the shooting in a dance. But now he was frightened in a way that he hadn't been. Because even though he'd been warned by them, the gunman then, that they were out to get him, he never thought they would try. And all of us now knew that with no trouble at all, they could succeed and how little it would take for them to try again. She goes on to say that everything went down the drain, everything because nobody could have anticipated the situation they were in now. She went back to Bull Bay after that just to pack some things and get them out of Jamaica. This was so unreal. So Friday... The third, then my practice for concert. And in the moment's blink of an eye, everything has changed. And now they're leaving town. When you discover that somebody will try to take you, she says, you have to start thinking differently. So plans had to change. Bob and the kids and her, along with Neville Garrett, went to Nassau to live for a while. So when Dan Taylor said they went straight to England, they did go to England, but first they went to Nassau. It says, in one of Chris Blackwell's homes, she says she called Bob's mother and she came down from Delaware to help out and stay a few days. And then it goes on to Sydney Breakspear, but I don't want to go there because this has already been heavy or not. Right? And so that is the back story of... Sadella says something, but Sadella wasn't there. She just heard through the ghetto grapevine what happened. Um, and at the time that it did happen, Sadella was on vacation because Mr. Booker had passed on suddenly. And therefore, Sadella says she needed a break. This is chapter 15 of Sadella, page 158. It's not that long. So let me go ahead and read Sadella's account. As a matter of fact, I'm not taking a commercial break in at this. This one too heavy. Let me just continue. So um, where am I? She says in November 1976, to settle her nerves, she decided to take a holiday and visit Jean Jane, Jen, what, who, Jen Jane in London. The trip was a consoling break for her. Her heart still heavy over Mr. Booker's sudden death. Mr. Booker died. We didn't read that part, but that's what happened. She says she visited relatives and saw the sights, reveling in the excitement and stir of London life. Early one morning, the phone rang before the first dawn light was even seeping over the choppy rooftops of the city. It was Carl, Bonnie's brother, calling from Wilmington. Miss Booker, he said nervously, your son get shot. What? She cried, saw her heart racing, but it's not serious, he added hastily. Is not serious. Take it easy. What happened? She cried. Some people shot him. Politics. But he's all right. Don't worry about yourself. About this. He is all right. Details of the attempted assassination were still sketchy and remain so to this day. 
but she learned that Nesta's manager, Don Taylor, was seriously injured too with several bullet wounds. Rita had also been grazed in the head by the same gunmen. It's interesting how they term Rita's uh, thing, grazed. But I'm going to just keep going. I, I, she says she asked Carl about the other children and he assured him that they were still in Delaware and just fine. And that Sister Rose, whom she had left in charge, said everybody was well. She had one leave week on vacation but remained in England as any longer was now impossible. She hurried home. She found everything as she had left it, the children busy with school and their daily lives. The house intact, the world of Wilmington going about its usual business like a circus merry-go-round. But an air of uncertainty hung over the house because Nesta had disappeared from Jamaica after the shooting and no one knew where to find him. So initially, they, they, they had right to concern about, you know, where would be a safe place. It says here, I waited for the call, she says. He was said to be have been shot, but not seriously wounded. But this information was mainly hearsay. She'd reach home on Friday afternoon. On Sunday, still hung up over with jet lag. I got up early, went downstairs in the quiet house and prayed her heart out that Nesta would call and assure her that he was well. She prayed until the children were beginning to move about with the first lights. Then the phone rang. It was Nesta calling from the Bahamas. Hi, mama, he said. Ja Rastafari, I exclaimed joyfully. Are you? Yes, mama. Oh, God. Me all right, mama. Me all right. Me was just praying ja to make me here from you. Where you there? Me at Chris Blackwell House in the Bahamas. All right, me coming to see you tomorrow. Come no, mama, come. The next day I flew down to Bahamas, was met at the airport and driven to Chris's house. Nesta was sitting with a group of companions in the backyard when I arrived and he hurled it over to embrace me. Because remember, Rita just said, Rita just said that um, uh, Sadella came, right? I burst into tears as we hugged. No cry, mama, he whispered, squeeze me tight. No cry. Me can't help myself, I said through tears. Met me see the wound. He showed me the torn spot in his flesh where he'd been shot. A bullet in Adisya armor right now, he said. He explained that the doctors told him that they couldn't remove the bullet because there was a danger of paralysis, which would prevent him from ever playing the guitar. The bullet would have to stay in his arm for the rest of his life. He told me about the assassination attempt, how he had been in the kitchen sharing a grapefruit with Don Taylor when gunmen raced up the stairs and burst in the room their machine guns blazing in the confusion that followed with shots thundering in the small room. So everybody's saying the same thing. And bullets whizzing everywhere, he felt a burning across his chest and a stinging in his arm. As quickly as the madness had begun, Nesta said it passed. The gunmen, their wick, wicked work done, thumped down the stairs and turned their murderous fire on Rita's VW that was pulling out the gate, shattering the back window and grazing her head. But according to Rita, it it was more than it was many of them, I think, simultaneously. Okay. So that is her account of what she experienced because she wasn't physically there. And um, yeah, that's what happened on December the 3rd. I'm gonna come to the comment section now. And uh, I'm gonna drop a link in the box if anybody has anything to say. It's a little different style today, but you don't know we made it through. And again, we're coming to the end of this here conversation. So, you know, it is what it is. The creator was with them that day. Fun fact, her family's from, she, she's Caribbean says, my family's from Bahamas, where Bob was not privy to quote outsiders. My dad and uncles were fishing and spotted Bob them and invited them to play soccer. My uncle has a the whole story about his toe. He said he was 16 around the time. Oh, that's interesting. It might be it might be for that same reason. They are, they're there right after the situation happened and they are on high alert. Yeah, the the the, the way in which they refer to the to Rita's situation. Yeah, Rita's Rita, yeah, today's thing is heavy. You know what I mean? Today thing was heavy. Uh but it is also a pivotal part not only in the movie, in the plot line, but also in how he goes from 
Bob Marley to Bob Marley. You understand me? I say it's kind of how Tupac went from Tupac to Tupac, and it's usually after something of this nature. Thank you for those who have just joined us. I put the link in the box. I'm just going through these comments. I, it does sound um, cutely crocheted um, that they downplayed what happened to Rita. <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> open to the out to open the gate to let out Bob's wife when she heard the shots rang out. I must have missed a part. Yeah, you know, you know, sometimes we're not the best. Our culture is not the best in transmuting very uh, important, heavy news. It's like they give you heavy news. I said, but don't worry yourself, man. It's like, what? You can't you can't tell somebody something like that. And then, you know. The shot was clearly what Ziggy was talking about, where his mother is concerned. Cindy comparing herself. Right. And that was the situation that we saw before the movie came out. Right. When Ziggy makes that reference, if we didn't know that this happened, we wouldn't know what he was talking about. And so this is why it's a lot of mystery and confusion to me around the situation because so much happened. But if we don't have a reference point, it just sounds like, huh? Winter says, I thought when you just read Don Taylor, it said Bob went to the Bahamas. Bob didn't, no, Don Taylor didn't say they went to the Bahamas. <clears throat> I'll go back there. Rita said they went to the Bahamas. Don Taylor said, I'll tell you what Don Taylor said. Do, 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 do. Hold on there one second. Give me a second, everybody. We can take a moment. Oh no, you're right. After the concert, no, it, it it said it said after the concert, Bob went to his house in Nassau. I think I was contesting that it wasn't his house, it was Chris Blackwell's house, and took Rita and the kids, both his and hers. We constantly keep in touch by telephone. Yeah. I think right there I was contesting that he said it was Bob's house, and then another part it said it was Chris Blackwell's house. So sorry about that if it's mistaken. No, no, no. I was mistaken. Nancy Burke told BBC that she had just returned from Camperoon duties with Miss World. She said the gates at 56 Hope Road was closed, which was unusual when she got there. Oh, maybe I missed something. The bullet in the arm? Actually, Bob says that. Let's go back to what Bob says one more time. For those who be like, but Bob Blunk said never said. This is what he says about it. And then I'm going to read the last comments and then we're going to boogie. Was anything, did anything happen to you that caused you to write that? Well, 1976, I'm shoot off from the right. Yes. And I figured that was survival, you know. Yeah. What happened when you were shot? You were in your home. Yeah. Was it in the morning or at night or what happened? Well, it was about, um, I said about nine o'clock in the night. Yeah. What happened is that um, the night before, about three nights before that, I, I was living at a place called Pool B, you know? Mm. And I went to about three o'clock in the morning and get a, and get some sleep. And then I vision I was in a lot of gunshot, you know? That was, that was a, a dream. I was in a, a, a barrage of gunshot. And, but when, when, when it all over, you know, it's like I never really getting a shot. But I see my mother get shot. You know, the vision show my mother get shot in her head. And what happened is that the vision said, don't run. You know, it's like, do you know that this gunshot is like something that the vision said, don't run, stand up. So when the gunshot started firing a hope road, the first thing come back to my mind was the vision. And all I could remember is that the vision said, don't run. And so I have to stand up, you know. And, you know, them fire fire until it was tired of fire and then she is, is, is not really a laughable gun battle. Man starts run and it ease up, you know. And Where were you hit? Eh? Where were you hit? Me? Yes, sir. 
Yeah. Went right through? Or just No, I said lodge inside there. Yeah? Yeah. You never saw the gunman? Well, at that time, no. But you know who did it? Yeah, I know that. Were they caught? No, but I don't call the police. Mm. It's just, you know, what I'm saying. All right, so I played it three times after everyone's account. So no one could say, <laughs> you know, that's everybody else's account. I played it three times. I read Don Taylor. I read uh, Sedella for what it was worth. And I read Vita. I didn't see major uh, differences in the story. Um, again, like everybody is saying, those were some perilous times during that time. Uh, and again, this is what pushes him out of the country, you know, to be in, in ex, make his exodus in, in self-imposed exile. This is the movie. And hopefully, I'm going to actually go back and watch the movie after all of this. Yeah, he did say it was lodged in his arm. I'm going to go back and watch the movie after all of this and see more parts that I didn't see now that, you know, I, I understand what I'm looking at more, right? So with that said... With that said, I'm just coming over here. Great cross reference in the moon. Agree with Ruth that the events changed their lives. Yeah, it did. It did. It did. It did. It did. It did. Yep, that's sad. This one, I tried to keep it, you know, because this one is heavy. It's a lot. One of the articles, and Devin, you know, I looked up the articles too. One of the articles, and I should have pulled it. Did I did I save the article? One of the articles said, Bob Marley's common law wife, Rita Marley, got shot. I was like, yo, y'all were violating day and night with this conversation. Like, what are y'all talking about? So one of the articles, let me see if I, I have saved that article. I was going to do a whole thing, but cha, I tell you, I don't know. No matter how much something I pull up, everybody says, I'm on, I like, yeah, make up things. Yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> this, I didn't write this. <laughs> you know, hold on. Let me see if I had saved that article if I said I couldn't bother. One second. I was like, did they just call Rita a common law? They was doing the most. They really kind of downplayed her even in, in the way in which she got injured. It's like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's so now we. Let me look on the down. Let me see. Let me see if Mr. still have it. No. I think I pulled it up, but I didn't. I pulled it up, but I think I closed. Hold on there. Give me one second. Y'all don't want to see how many tabs I got up. <laughs> when you're doing research, I have a lot of tabs open. <laughs> If not, it was in the Gleaner. I know for sure it was in the Gleaner. I can't go look for it now. I thought I already had it saved, but I don't. But yeah. Yeah, he goes from the man to the legend because it's like, oh, them scrape off of the man. He may escape all of this. Then him come back upon stage. You know what I mean? So he goes from the man. Then, it, you, you know, they continue to build the myth and the legend. And if you look at the life of Tupac, Shakur, the same thing happened. Right, the, with the quad studio shooting, this is the same thing happens. And when when he comes back and see, he survives, and he's a musician, much in the same way, he he moves from you know this musician that's on a level with other musicians to this, you know, even today for 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 rap, Tupac is what Bob Marley is for reggae. You understand me? I said so. You could kind of see the correlation. Thank you, thank you, thank you everybody for tuning in so i don't see let me see here i really do appreciate it akoti you're welcome you're welcome yep i'm gonna watch the movie again dr charles i'm with you because i'm like now that we have learned so much what were we missing <laughs> you know what i mean and this is to, to uh to line up the story at this time is where we saw that when we read the sydney breakspeare article and it says that she was she was she was missing. This is at which time she comes to, um, at which time she comes she leaves her duties as Miss World, and then she goes to Bahamas, and then later on 
you know, Rita says she knew better not to come by the house or whatever. And then she went to a hotel. So all of this is like, I Rita actually leaves the incident and goes right into Sydney Breakspear, but I just stopped it short right there because we don't want to go over there right now. We don't want to go over there right now. If you haven't liked the video, thumbs up the video, share the video. You understand all of those lovely stuff so that we can continue to grow and have these very important conversations. It says in the book, so much things to say. There are other people giving their account of the shooting as well. It all lines up with what Rita and Don said. Okay, that's cool. That is absolutely cool. I haven't gotten to so much things to say because there's so much here. <laughs> there's so much here. Yeah, they wanted her to be common law. So the next thing I'm going to go into, like I said, as I wind down, is Rita goes into what happens. I'm contemplating about um, the end. It's really sad. This one is somber, and the end for Bob is also somber. It's something that, you know, yeah. So I'm contemplating when I'm going to read that. But I am going to read the aftermath, right, um, which is, Don Taylor goes into a lot of the aftermath and Rita does. So we're going to cross reference those two in the aftermath of what happens. Rita, you know, goes into not feeling as though she has much help. And Don goes into him feeling that as a friend and former manager, that now it's his responsibility to, even though Bob doesn't have a, a will to uh, do as Bob had instructed him. And so that would lead us into the paperwork. So we probably got like two more episodes of this particular series to go. And um, yeah. Yep, 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 yep. So with that said. Yeah, the article about skill. Actually, Don Taylor actually goes into that um, situation that he's alleging, you know, I, I, the article, you know, again, people will say it's alleged. We don't know. But Don Taylor also goes into that horse race situation as well. Yeah, the, 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 the sickness part kind of heavy. We already went a lot into, you know. So with that said, if anybody has anything else to say, you could do so at this time. If not, I'm going to go ahead and wind down. We finish work early today, people. <laughs> we said finish work early today. And this is a part of history. It's an important part of history. Somebody asks, I think somebody asks, do you think Bob would, there would be, uh, be a, another Bob Marley? I think at the time that he was who he was in the context you can't recreate because Bob Marley didn't come out of a vacuum. He didn't become this figure in 1960. At others, you, you put at first and then as you start to type their name, you should see it come up. I'm just tripping. If you put at the, the at sign and then you start to plot the person's name, then YouTube should populate it. So, um, yeah, because he didn't exist in a vacuum, he didn't become this figure in 1960s when he was singing Ska, right? He didn't become this. It was at a time where everything was converging, independence, Rastafarianism, um, reggae music, a, a whole lot of things had to, the political scene. Many things were happening at the same time that made this this message so transformative. You can't recreate that necessarily because you would need all the other factors as well. I see T Sims in the in the building. Welcome to the conversation. Hello, how are you? I'm all right. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. I'm so glad I was able to catch a live. Uh, oh, wow. I had never. I'm just recently uh, discovering your channel and I love it. I love the way you do tell your stories and you add the pot to it. It makes it more real. You know? Thank you, thank you. I do. Uh, I have been following Bob Marley for the past 10 years now. And, you know, it was so much I didn't know about him because, you know, here in America, everybody like they kind of look at him like the marijuana man, you know, and I don't <laughs> like it because he did so much, more, right. you know, right. and stuff like that. 
Okay, but when it comes to Rita, you know, that, you know, when I learned of who she was, that was the only person I ever respected, like, in my, you know, this lady Cindy and everything, you know, I just think that was kind of brought to him, like, you know, it was almost arranged to me, because I have to wonder if Peter Tosh was in his situation, would they have done that, you know, like, but Rita... To me, I think that's Bob's truth. He he really did love Rita. I really I really believe that. It, I mean, you know, the late great Bob Marley, he could have did anything he wanted. Um, if he wanted to divorce her, he could have divorced her, but he didn't. You know, and for this lady to be shot in her head like that, you know, I I think I saw an interview that he done, and he said he had a dream that his mother was shot in the head or whatever. Maybe he kind of looked at her like that because she kind of reminded him of her i guess you know but um to me i think that you know they kind of downplay her a lot if it wasn't for her um you know keeping his legacy alive and stuff and the children you know i think a lot of us in the u.s wouldn't have known who he was you know it right. wasn't until i was grown that i knew who he was you know and i never heard his music played on my radio and stuff right. like that you know, so, but she did a lot for him, you know, and um, like I said, the lady, Cindy Breakspear, this lady need to get up off of her soapbox, you know, her son, her son don't even talk about him, like, let him talk, although he was two, you know, let him tell his story as if, you know, of what he was told about his, he don't even talk, she's on there talking, that's all the time, you know, she constantly talking, none of the other mothers but one came forward in a the uh, movie Marley, that documentary they they did, right, right. That was yeah, one right. other mother came forward, and she up there bragging about, yeah. But he also wrote Mid Midnight Ravers for that lady that came on there. That's what yeah. he do. He a songwriter, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so he yeah. was finessing her, you know. He probably figured that, yeah, Nesta for Nesta. So you I know, <laughs> he he was he probably figured that just as much as you probably think you could use me, I'ma use you too. You know, that's wow. why he made the song "Waiting in Vain." She wasn't trying to deal with him. He was a he was a, a third world star. He wasn't a renowned star like you know when she got to him. I think it was told to her he's gonna be bigger than this one day. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, right. That's why she's still clouting off him now. You know, oh my goodness. Can yeah. I ask you one quick question? Sure. Are you from are you from New Orleans? Of course I am. Of you course I can hear it. <laughs> you know that, baby. <laughs> I was waiting of for it. <laughs> of course I am. Thank you but, so much for coming. Yes, but I do appreciate and and one more thing, one more thing, and I'm mm -hmm. gonna get off of here. No, you um, good. for the movie, mm -hmm. everybody, I seen a lot of people upset and they was mad. The movie yeah. is called Bob Marley, One Love, not Bob Marley, His Life. If you want to see his life, go watch the Marley. They got a lot of documentaries out they about him. They do have him. a lot of documentaries. That yeah. was, to me, it was like Ziggy, Sadella, and Steven, and all the, I think that was their accounts based off of how they saw their mom and Bob together. Right. And that right. probably was a gift they gave her. That's why it was on February so. the 14th. I think you know, so. Yeah. yeah, I think it was a nice gesture that they did, but they need to up this lady. This lady should have Bob Marley should have been kissing this lady feet, real real talk, you know. Wow. But um, but I thank you and I love I'm you know I'm gonna I'm a member now. I'm gonna be watching you and thank I appreciate you. everything you do. Thank you so much. Thank you okay. for coming through and letting your voice be heard. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Bye bye. All right, all right, all right, everybody. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. This episode was heavier than usual. You understand? And so, yeah, we have to respect life, you know. Hopefully, we learn the lessons from the past. This is also shows about disagreements, communication effectively. You know, why do we... To a certain degree, he's trying to establish peace in a place. And good night, everyone who has to go to their bed. In a place where we don't understand how to how to come to terms with certain things. Right? Um, you know, so so what I'm saying is that the, the important takeaway lessons from this is is 
is looking at, hold on. I'm sorry, guys. Give me one second. Hold on. Actually, I'm going to have to go to commercial right now. Just hold still. And I'm going to be right, right back. Dr. Charles, I see you. Give me two seconds. Listener, all of this jokes and reading got me feeling a little hungry. Do you guys come with your snacks ready or do you think it's time for an ital food break? The Ross and him Empress say, yeah, ital food break. So listener, this is Imuna. And not only do I read and write novels, I also do a little something, something. Well, a kind of big something in the kitchen, right? So I wrote this amazing hay pumpkin cookbook. Inside, pumpkin seed milk, carrot punch, smoothie, listener, even jerk tofu strips. But the tofu is made from pumpkin seeds. So join me on a culinary adventure with the pumpkin seed as we explore the benefits of this green superfood. You already know, potassium, zinc, it is loaded and highly beneficial. Again, a high source of iron, zinc, magnesium, vitamin E, and it helps boost the immune system. This book, as well as Island Twist, is available on Amazon today. So go on over and let's get back to the story. All right. Thank you guys for that. I have Dr. Charles. Welcome to the conversation. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening. chat. Boy, the chat is on fire tonight, um, <laughs> especially for Queen Rita, which is really, you know, something that's necessary to be discussed because this woman has been so disrespected in the media. And part of it, I believe, um, is Bob's doing, you know, his denial of, um, you know, being married to her and other things. But two things I want to point out. I love that the discussion about colorism came up in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, some women or, or men, I, I'm sorry, I don't know, <laughs> you know what gender you are, but talked about, um, there was discussion about colorism maybe playing a part in, in Rita's, um, downplaying Rita, you know, not feeling, you know, feeling that she was just too dark for Bob, you know, once he became rich and famous and, um, that, you know, the, the white beauty queen then, you know, took the front seat. But I really, in my heart, believe that there wouldn't be a Bob Marley as we know him without Rita. She, she was very instrumental in, in his success and afterwards as well. So I think there needs to be, you, you know, we need to big up Rita more, um, and the disrespect, you know, in the media needs to be, needs to stop. It really needs to stop. There, there's no competition between her and Cindy. She was the wife. Cindy was the, you know, the mistress. Um, and respect is due to Rita for all that she did for Bob. Um, I believe a lot of it has affected her. I believe she held on to a lot and she swallowed a lot. And I believe that that may have contributed, you know, to the series of strokes and, you know, stress. That's a lot for one woman to deal with all of her life. And, you know, when you saw her, she was always smiling and downplaying things that had happened to her, which may you know, also contributed, contribute to, you know, everyone else downplaying everything. But um, Rita's a queen. And there, like I said, there would be no Bob as we see him without Arita. I think more people need to recognize that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. so much. Definitely. Definitely. Another point is when we hear about the children, um, Bob's many children, um, a lot of times it's said with pride how he has so many children and all these wonderful, talented children. But when they talk about Stephanie and Sharon, they're described as Rita's children from extramarital, I mean, not Rita's, uh, not, not, not so much Sharon, but Stephanie, Rita's child from extramarital affair. But you don't hear that when they're talking about the children from other women that Bob has had. It's not described that way. 
It's not Bob's children from an extramarital affair. It's just Bob's children. Mm. Yeah, another point I wanted to to make, but I That's just wanted point. to give, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to give Rita her kudos uh, because she really deserves to be put on a pedestal right along with him. Oh, wow, wow, wow. This is <laughs> <laughs> This a lot. Is, yep, it's a lot. It's a lot. I'm a little somber today because I'm definitely listening and, and I, I agree that even in this incident, you see it, you know, yeah. you see the spin. I, I didn't get to find back the Gleena article, but it it called her his uh, his uh, common law wife in the article. And I'm like, what in the world? Why? Is yeah. 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 So, you know, you see it on a continuum. And I do think, as the first caller said, that to a degree, uh, this movie was to give her, to honor her in a way that maybe she had not been honored before. You understand? Even yes. though there were outliers and the reality is that he was had all of these women, but she was there very early on and helped towards, you know, the building of and the, the, the investing in what ultimately became what we experienced as Bob Marley and the Whalers. Exactly. So, so, How sure. many of us would take a bullet to our head and be okay with him going to go see his mistress while we, you know, we suffered an injury, you know, uh, while we're recuperating and then raising his children, you know, him having children and bringing them for, you know, home to us to raise and, and to, you know, to be able to, uh, to, to be, um, what? what was he asking her to chase women out of his room for him when he was, you know, tired? Who does that? You know, how many of us would even suffer that way? She's a better woman than I am. I know that. That's yeah, that, that, as you said, that, that the self-sacrifice oh. of even to the degree, like you said, he's like, you're saying to him, I don't think this, this is the best thing to do. Because as she's saying, you know, as, concerning what we read, this, this, you know, in the movie, they're like, oh, back away from it, you know, leave it right. alone. And he's, how many people will say, listen, bro, I told you to leave it alone. And then you're, you're not only, are you going to still do it? You want me to sing back up? <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. This song, this in the I want you to sing it. Right. It's like, huh? <laughs> how many of us would even do that? You know? So true. Yeah. This it's gonna be like, yeah, you can sing, and 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 and, she, and Rita notes that Marcia heard, yeah, you better not go out there. Marcia's like, well, no, no, no. Marcia did the dawn uh -huh. She was like, I'm not going out there. But Rita goes and supports him, which is just oh my wow. Gosh. Yeah, yeah, she <laughs> sacrificed a lot. Yeah, a lot, and. Maybe one day we can talk about the colorism that's probably involved in all this. You know, no, no, not probably. You know what? If, if there was colorism, there is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you have, you know, Cindy had privilege um, and still does. You know, she's a very outspoken, even though she's Jamaican, she's a very outspoken white woman. With, she's very, very brazen, as my grandmother would say. And um, very proud of her position um, in his life, to the detriment of Rita, of us of others disrespecting Rita. So, so, as a as a therapist, what what if you like I said the other day, if if your daughter was in the position that Rita is, and and yes, she had to endure a lot, and we give her her flowers. But mm -hmm. on the other side of it, the, like what Auntie was trying to convey to her at at one point, right? What mm -hmm. would you tell a young girl in a situation, say she's young, 25, 26, mm -hmm. and by this time, you know, she has like four children or so, what would you say? I would tell my daughter, you need to know your worth and add tax, baby. You mm -hmm. are, you are worthy of more than this. You know, I believe her self-esteem was probably low. Well, definitely. You mm -hmm. don't, you can't, you can't believe that, that you have, um, worth in yourself and allow a man to use you as a doormat like that mm. and to put his hands on you like that and stay with him, you know? So yeah, as a therapist, um, you know, even if I were her therapist, I would help her to find her self-esteem, her self-worth mm. and to love herself more and to realize her value so that, you know, she could 
um, you know, stand up for herself and not allow this abuse to happen because it was abuse. She was abused physically. Thank she was abused emotionally. Oh yes, she was, she was, she was abused. And uh, we downplay that a lot because Rita doesn't make a big deal of, you know, she, she minimizes it, which is what battered women do. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, if, if, you know, being her mother her or her auntie, I would try to drive into her how much she needs her, how much her self-esteem is low and she needs to really start working on loving herself. She had so much love to give her own children and his um, children from other women, you know, but not loving herself enough mm -hmm. to put a stop to what happened, you know? And hopefully that's what, you know, uh, one of the takeaways, like, again, we didn't do all of this, or I didn't do all of this to just do it. it there's some takeaways that we can find. And I, and I shared something from, I shared something from Sadella um, that she's teaming up with, uh, she's teaming up with another fashion brand and some of the money is going to go towards domestic survivors of domestic uh, violence and, and, bringing a shining a light. I want to give the actual name because I think it's interesting that even if they're not necessarily coming out and saying, uh, you know, this is what happened. Let me tell you all about what happened and the way in which the, the, the things that they choose to support, you can kind of see what's important. You understand what I'm saying? So yes. Yes. I think that's important to note. I'm going to tell you the name yeah. of it now. Oh, good. That's good to hear. Sadella also is encouraging people to read her mother's book. And we then there you go. And the mother's book is number one. And people keep right. telling me that. And I'm like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? Because so, yeah. guess what? Now mm -hmm. we can have an informed discussion. And it goes beyond. Maybe we came here because we were interested. Yeah? Right. But no, we've gotten so much more than that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because yes. now we can look at our own lives. And even if we didn't see abuse, even if it was normalized in our own lives, verbal, our physical, our mental, emotional, a lot mm -hmm. of the things that the elders were going through, it was situations of abuse that became normalized in the culture and in that specific family unit. Right. Yeah. And then we, and then we say, oh, no, not never ran with that because my grandfather used to mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And when you reflect in your mind, you're like, oh, well, no wonder granny used to do such and such. No wonder Annie used to do such and such. And in some instances, some men, not all, sometimes when people think about domestic abuse, you only think about women. Sometimes right. men are abused too. Oh, oh, yes, definitely. And of it's course. more shame when the men are abused because yeah. how you going to come out and say, a woman a body up. Right. That's true. That's true. And, and men will not report it. They and they won't report it because it's shameful. No. Exactly. Exactly. The, the name yeah. of the company is Rep JA, Represent Jamaica. And the Protect Caribbean Women campaign is dedicated initiative by Rep JA, which is aimed at fostering positive change in the lives of Caribbean women who have endured abuse, violence, and injustice. I'll put the link. Dilla, I love it. Good okay. for you, Sidella. So you. Yeah. I wanted to share yeah. that because, you know, every October I try to put something out there about domestic abuse month. Well, in America anyway, it's domestic right. ab violence awareness month. You understand? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it comes in so many different forms. And this is what causes us now when it becomes normalized, we go outside and then we expect that we're going to interact with other people in the same way we've been trained at home. Yes. And then you have problems at work and you have problems in the community and you have problems here and it's everybody else and it's not you. Not exactly. the way you're talking to people, not the way you're interacting with people. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because because we we remain quiet about it, that's, you know, that why do you think there's so much femicide in the world? There's a yeah. lot. Right. Yeah. Right. There is a lot. It's, we need to, you know, speak up and good for her. I can imagine, you know, being a little girl and seeing that happening in your home and you have to pretend that everything's great because your dad's famous and you don't want to say anything. Question, oh, right, okay. right. Looking at the other side of it, just like yeah. you're saying, what is that like? Mm -hmm. Somebody yeah. asked Ziggy, um, did that really happen about the slap? Mm. And Basically, he answered them without going too far into detail, like, bro, me know what me see. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like, I wow. did. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I'm not going to. Because he looked and said, yo, I'm going to my, 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 my family business. Mm -hmm. Like, 
yeah. protective. You understand? Yeah. But also confirming yeah. that it's not far from the truth. Yeah. And, and then we read in the mother's book that Bob would box him woman in at the mouth. And we're reading Arita's book that if she get back, she'll go box back or mm -hmm. whatever it may be. And then we see, okay, they did see not only verbal, emotional, but physical. Exactly. And, and people don't know, even today, they don't realize that when a child sees this kind of domestic violence, it changes who they are forever. True. It changes who they're, the whole tra trajectory of their life. True. So these kids suffered as well, you True. know, and, and thank God they have an outlet, you know, their, their art where they can express these things, you know, and hopefully some of them did get some help, um, you know, some mental health help, but it's a lot to endure. You know, I can't imagine having to keep quiet about it because you don't want to tarnish your father's memory, and, but at the same time, you want to support your no. mom. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. that's torn in the middle yes. and I, that's where they are now in in yes. the sense of like as somebody said it in another life trapped in this legacy oh god but also not being able to say the truth the full truth because the truth shot this and i think this is why to a certain degree this is mm -hmm. me surmising i'm getting a lot of the how could you amuna why would you <laughs> yeah. know I mean? and i'm like what on there what on there what on there <laughs> Exactly. exactly. I'm like, wait a minute. Now I'm reading what they said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's like, how could you say the quiet part out loud? You know, mm -hmm. how could, how could you be? You are the one who's doing something wrong, and this is why people get shamed into being quiet because you're saying something that's ugly. You didn't do the ugly thing, but because you're giving voice to it, that's the only way we're gonna heal is right. moving through the pain. We right. cannot stay on one side of the pain and cower in the corner and then say, oh, I'm over it. We're not because you have to go through all of those feelings and all of those emotions. How can someone I love so much do something that can hurt someone else that I love also that much? Exactly. You understand me? I said, so they're going to let me go into my um my, my, <laughs> <laughs> my healing bag, but I'm going to stay oh, on this side. I'm gonna you are so knowledgeable. And, and I'm glad that this subject is coming up because we do need to talk about the other side. Right. You know, we do need to talk about this. And like I said, kudos, congratulations to Sadella. This is part of her healing. This is part of her healing. And I think it's wonderful that she's doing, you know, doing this right. you, by helping. They say a, a lot of times when we suffer through something, the best way to heal is to help someone else. To get through you know? it. Right. And this, yeah, uh, it. this will be a very successful um, project that she's working on. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, and it, it, again, hopefully we don't miss the good mm. for the salacious, for the titles, you know, the, the, for the for the stuff that tickles our fancy. Then, then, then we miss out on, you know, what? Oh wow, somebody is speaking to that. Good I wonder point. what that is about. You understand? So yes. you have to yeah. find your balance in the whole mm. conversation because, as like I said in the comment section, so, like you know, you never know who's in the comment section. Mm -hmm. Okay. When yeah. I did the when I did the one of the first videos about Rita's indiscretions um, with Taki, somebody came in the comment section is like, "Yo, I'm related to him, and mm -hmm. you're funny, and and he would think you're funny too." Right. You know what I'm, right. I'm talking cognizant. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pretend I'm not reading what I'm reading, but I'm also speaking aware that this you know people are listening. Yes. And, and and so that you want to add that level of humanity to it, you know? Right. And yeah. and you honestly argue with the truth. I mean, the truth is there. It's clear as day. And, you know, you want to make an issue of it, but it's the truth. You can't change it, you know? No, no you can't change it. But again, you know, the dichotomy is holding these two different realities, right? And trying to have, to, to reckon them. How do I say you were this great person and also say you did these things? Yeah. yeah. And you understand what I'm saying? And we people, we we don't we 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 don't do well with that. There's a dissonance that's created in our mind and our spirit to try to either make make the other one go away, either you were really good or really bad. You it's know, difficult. Yeah, point, go ahead. You're that no, you when you said um uh when you said there's a dissonance. I thought of Rita, cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You are you are so brilliant. Thank you. you. So brilliant. I, thank and you. I, I studied this for many years, trying to 
with my own self, my own family, my own reality, try to understand, you know, when they say you start to ask yourself questions, you know, mm-hmm. what, what's going on with me? What, you know I mean? To try to figure out your own thing. Now, everybody, we overlap. We don't have the same experiences, but we do have overlap. Yes. Right. And, and especially when, as a child, you don't process, you still hold on to it, the pain from a child's perspective. So you can be 40 and 50 and still doing do the five-year-old's eyes, the seven-year-old's eyes, right? Yep. And it's giving that inner child, growing that inner child and giving that inner child uh, permission to feel and pass through that pain there. Healing the inner child in you. Right. And well, that that takes bravery. <laughs> oh, it does. It does. You have to be brave to do it and you have to be strong. You have to yeah. be strong because that's very painful. Very painful. Yeah. That's very painful. And that's why I promote journaling, writing your own book, writing your own narrative. Why? Because you're going to buck up on, wow, I didn't know I felt that way. You might put down the pen for uh, three months. You might come to a situation that happened and you, for three months, you still, from day to day, chewing on it, like you're chewing the cud, you know? Mm -hmm. And following the train of thought, okay, is that why I'm like this? So when I talk about communication, why? It's a hard-learned lesson Yes. in my own personal journey. This is why I'm so big on it. Mm-hmm. This is why I tell people come in and, and say what you have to say, even if I don't agree, right? And right. without fear that I'm going to, like, attack you. Or... <laughs> no, always so very understanding and neutral. No. Yeah. I try to be because without that patience, how do I express love when I can't listen to you? Amen. That's so true. Yeah, Dr. Charles, I like to talk to you. You know, you come on and we reason and think. <laughs> help, I enjoy help you people. Well. Yeah, I enjoy you as well. And hopefully our, um, your chat is enjoying it as yes, well. Yes, hopefully. And, and we would love input from them too, you know? No, Chief yeah. says he has to leave the chat. This is low-key man-hating show tonight. Oh, my goodness. Come on, click the okay. link then, no, Chief. That's yeah. some you ladies pick toxic men. I must be missing the chat. I'm over here talking to Dr. Charles. Who, who's who's up? Who's going on? What's going on in the chat? <laughs> I must have missed something. We, we haven't said anything against men at all, so I don't I think, know. I think men and women that? need to come to the conversation. Okay. I, I, and this is why somebody might be like, Amuna, you hitting on Rita, and then the next day you hitting on Bob because I'm not about manhood and woman bashing. I think there's value in everyone, and everyone needs to come to the conversation for us to move forward. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. We don't know what them do to um Chief. Chief same God. Chief Mayago. Come back, Chief. Come on. Oh. <laughs> yeah, tell Chief to hit the link. Maybe we, you know, we'd love to hear a man's perspective, correct? Always. Right? Always. Always. The link is there. I don't just put the link. I say only woman click the link. We put the link. <laughs> I have to read this chat so I can see what's going on. <laughs> yeah, we missed something. All right, Dr. Charles, thank you so much for coming through. Always a pleasure being here. Thank uh, you for all that you do. You're welcome. All right. Good night. Right, bye-bye. <laughs> you guys, I missed something. I guess we're going to have to pick that up on the other side because I don't know what happened. Um, Let me see what happened here. Let me see what happens here. Some women are here, on here, are vicariously living through Rita's pain. Okay, I think I see where the conversation. Um, you could come up and share your thoughts. I think that, that it's the pain is identifiable. If you've seen this situation, if you know of certain situations, yeah, I think people connect with people who they can identify with. So, I mean, that, is that necessarily a bad thing unless, unless you take it to put it across the board and then try to condemn everybody? I'm just trying to see where we went here um, in the comment section. Chief says both Rita and Bob were toxic. I would have to say both contributed uh, – to the situation, the toxic relationship that they had. I said that early on that. I think, I think they both became what they became, but initially they both had similar deficits, uh, that caused the relationship to become what it became. Right. And that, that they were, they had things missing within their lives and they didn't know how to relate in a healthy way based on what they 
put in the text and shared, you know. Uh, anything else? Anything else? I don't know what he did to Cindy. I don't know. I tried to. Okay, that's when. Okay, that's when the exit came. I, well, you know, we should be able to hear other people's thought processes, you know, and be able to try to Id identify or understand where they're coming from. We don't necessarily have to, unless you were being attacked. I, you know, it is what it is. Wonderful discussion. I would love to have a psychologist have an open discussion about Rita's psyche and how it affected her relationship. Yeah, it was a good discussion. I think in 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 Rita's book, she does she does have a lot of empathy for Bob. I would say that it would be the difference in the conversation. Uh, we don't hear that because Bob's uh, thing is more of a, a, a audio book in his in his lyrics and his interviews. And I would have to say in in Rita's book, you see more of a, a, a just in the way she's placing it, she felt more inclined towards him. Poor Bob, you know, she said that often, even till it's like, yo, not poor Bob again. So I would say Marcia in that I agree that her book, she had him more inclined towards his state more than we see him towards her, you know. Blessings, blessings, blessings. Nasima says she read the book and cried. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lot. It's a lot. There was a lot of pain in the history, not just in this story. I'm just talking about in general, there was a lot of pain coming down through the generations. And I'm here to say, if we don't heal the pain, if we don't acknowledge the pain, we cannot heal the pain. Right. It's that we reason why we are drawn to their story is because it's familiar in some way, some form, some aspect. And if we don't acknowledge it, this is why I'm grateful to them to writing it down, whatever their motive was. They left something that was sufficient enough for us to go through and even be able to have this many conversations and walk away with this many insights that before this point, maybe we didn't even think about. So for that, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to them. To that, I'm grateful to them. Yes, and I would agree, Les, Lesma. Um, actually, Rita actually says that sometimes she was the aggressor when she felt indifferent or when she felt jealous or whatever the case may be, that Rita is saying that she would be the aggressor. She would be the first one and then she would be easy to cry. So I would agree with that. And sometimes people say, oh, she's not telling the whole truth, but she did say that of herself as well. Oh, share it. If you want to share the essay review, uh, feel free to share that in the description below, uh, or if you just send it to me and then I'll put it, if the link is not going to Dr. Carl, Carolyn Cooper, a Jamaican scholar and friend wrote an essay review. I would like to read that. That, that sounds like something that's worth looking into. Yes, yeah, she did feel sorry for him. She said it often. Poor Bob, poor Bob. If we had, if I did a word count as a matter of fact, <laughs> I'm going to do a word count for the amount of time she said, poor Bob in the book. It's a lot. It's a lot. She said poor Bob a lot. All right, everybody. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I want to thank everybody for tuning in and then letting your voice be heard. I'm going to go ahead and wind down now. Whoa, we are two hours in. So with that said, like, subscribe, share, and, you know, hug, hug a loved one. You know what I mean? If you accidentally scream at somebody, apologize. You know, sit down and have a conversation. Have a heart-to-heart -heart with somebody who you need to clear up a matter with. You know, get it off of your chest. Write a letter. <laughs> you know, old school, dear such and such. Do something that moves you closer. If that's what you feel you need to do in your heart, soul, and mind, something that's going to move you closer to feeling free and to healing. Um, yeah. So with that said, that's my two cents. Thank everybody for tuning in. Everybody have a blessed night.